the previous class we were discussing about an example problem uh, in which uh, we are wanting to find out the uh, displacement response of the uh, structure using modal analysis technique. Uh, the problem uh, was that of a cable state bridge uh, in which uh, this cable state bridge we had uh, solved before for finding out the value of the R matrix and in that uh, the degrees of freedom uh, the, those are considered as the degree of freedom uh, which are dynamic or dynamic degrees of freedom that we identified are the, these two uh, displacements at the top of the tower and a vertical displacement at the middle of the deck. Uh, there were four support degrees of freedom and three rotations. So, we condensed out the rotational degrees of freedom first and they then formed a 4 plus th uh, 3 7 by 7 matrix. Out of that uh, again uh, we uh, uh, took out the three non support degrees of freedom that is partition that stiffness matrix. Uh, so, that the three non support degrees of freedom are identified and from there we uh, obtain the R matrix that is the influence coefficient matrix uh, we uh, described before. Now, using that uh, influence coefficient matrix, now uh, we are wanting to solve this problem uh, using the modal analysis technique and one can and uh, see here that the matrix K for the 3 degrees of freedom are the uh, this matrix that is 3 by 3 matrix and the mass matrix again is a 3, uh, three by 3 diagonal mass matrix. The R matrix that we had already obtained for this cable state bridge uh, that is shown over here 3 by 4 R matrix. The 3 frequencies that we obtained for this structure was omega 1, omega 2 and omega 3. Corresponding to each frequency we had a mode shape that is phi 1 t, phi 2 t and phi 3 t shown over here. You can see that the first mode shape is such that the two pylons are having displacement in the opposite direction that is one in the negative with the negative sign other with the positive sign, but by the same amount and the deck is going up rather than the uh, rather than going down. The second mode is a mode in which both the pylons move in the same direction and there was no uh, displacement at the center of the deck. Third mode uh, is such that in which the two pylons again move uh, in the opposite uh, uh, in the opposite direction and uh, the deck instead of going up goes down. So, these are the three mode shapes for the structure. So, using that mode shape one can obtain the three gen, uh, modal equations. The first modal equation is written in this form and here we have phi 1 t and this is phi 1 t m phi 1 that is we take the first mode shape and here this r basically would be the first column that is the first column of this r matrix. So, uh, uh, with this uh, we obtain the uh, phi i t m r and uh, and we get uh, 
this as the uh, um, quantity that we obtain once we multiply m into r when we multiply that then we get uh, this quantity and uh, with this quantity uh, we form the pg1 matrix that is in forming the pg1 matrix we multiply 1.474 into x double dot g1 plus 0 0.008 into x double dot g2 and so on and add them together to get a the load at a particular time t for the uh, pg1 load so this pg1 is a time dependent load which is called the generalized load and at every instant of time t one can obtain a value for this using this equation delta t is taken as 0 0.025 so far as the accelerations at the four supports are concerned uh, we construct uh, this time history of acceleration at the, the different supports from the 30 seconds of actual earthquake record. Since we have uh, uh, four supports, so we have got three spaces uh, in between and if we assume that 5 second is the phase time lag between the two supports, then the total uh, record of the excitation would be 30 plus 15 second that is 45 second. Uh, x double dot g1 will have first 30 seconds as the actual earthquake record and rest of the 15 seconds will have 0 values. Similarly, x double dot g2 will have first 10 seconds as uh, 0 values, then there will be 30 second of the actual earthquake record and the last 5 second will be again 0 values. That way we can uh, obtain the time histories of excitation for all the um, uh, supports and then we perform the analysis uh, using the modal analysis technique. The results are shown over here, this is the first generalized force, the time history of that is plotted over here, this is the second generalized force, uh, it is plotted again over here and one we have taken a plot up to 35 um, second. In fact, you can see that after 30 second, these values of the generalized load are very small. We have the first generalized displacement time history like this and uh, we can see that after again 30 second, the displacement decreases and continues up to 45 second that is the total uh, length of time of excitation at each support. Therefore, we have the responses up to 45 seconds. This is the second generalized displacement uh, that is again shown over here. Uh, we solve the problem both using the time history analysis and the frequency domain analysis using modal analysis technique. So, the results were compared for the generalized displacement Z1, Z2, Z3. So, we took all the three modes. As a result of that, the modal analysis and the direct analysis would not show up any difference. If we had taken less number of modes for solving the problem, uh, there would have been a difference between a direct uh, analysis and the modal analysis because uh, in the direct analysis we take 
the contributions from all modes, whereas in the modal analysis, the number of modes that we consider in the analysis uh, depends uh, how we choose uh, uh, the number of modes uh, that is considered to be important. So, therefore, many a time we do not take contribution from all the modes uh, and we may, may be taking the first contribution of the first few modes. In this particular example, we have taken all the three modes and uh, the solution obtained from the time history and frequency domain analysis, uh, they were compared over here and we can see that both in terms of RMS value and the peak value, the results are matching quite well. The reason for this is that while performing the time history analysis, we assumed zero displacement and zero velocity in the beginning. That is the initial condition was zero and zero. Therefore, the transient part of the solution uh, was not significant at all and the, the uh, time history and frequency domain analysis they masked very well in terms of RMS and peak values. Uh, the crucial point in the modal analysis is the number of modes that is to be taken into analysis. Uh, for example, if we have a structure having 100 degrees of freedom, then we will have 100 mode shapes and 100 frequencies. And uh, one of the objective of the modal analysis uh, was to uh, obtain a problem which would be uncoupled problem that is a coupled differential equation need not be solved. So, we, uh, we should uh, we shall solve a single degree of freedom equation uh, and we wish to also solve as less number of equation of motion as possible. Uh, yet, at the same time, uh, we should get a, a good result that is a result which is almost correct. So, with uh, this end in view, the number of modes that is uh, considered for the analysis that depends upon uh, the nature of excitation, dynamic characteristics of the structure and the response quantity of interest. Looking at these three uh, quantities, uh, we decide how many number of modes uh, we should consider in the analysis. Lesser the number of modes uh, will uh, require less computational time. One index which is used to determine the number of modes required uh, for getting fairly accurate result is called the mass participation factor. And the mass participation factor is uh, worked out using uh, this expression. Here lambda i, this is equal to the mode participation factor, mr is the mass attached to the rth degree of freedom and phi i r is the mode shape coefficient in the ith mode for the rth degree of freedom. So, if we sum this over the all uh, degrees of freedom, then we get the mass participation factor for the ith mode. And uh, these uh, summation at the top that we obtain, that is of course multiplied by the total mass of the system. So, uh, this uh, shows uh, the ratio between the total mass of the system and the mass that is considered in the analysis through the number of modes that we are considering uh, in the analysis. So, that is why it is called a mass participation factor that is in the ith mass, uh, ith mode, what is the percentage of the mass that is considered in the analysis. The number of modes 
m to be considered in the analysis is determined by this uh, equation. That means, for each mode we find out the mass participation factor, sum them together over the number of modes and when we get it to be more or less equal to 1, then we decide about what should be the number of modes that we uh, should take into consideration. Generally, it is found that if we take say first 5 or first 10 modes in a structure, we are able to take into consideration about 95 percent of the mass of the system. So, in that case, uh, we satisfy ourselves by considering you know, 5 to 10 modes uh, of a very large structure. And therefore, for a large structure, we benefit by reducing the, cal uh, the calculations uh, because we have to then solve 5 or 10 single degree of freedom equation to get the final answer. Now, this is so far as the displacement response is concerned. Uh, the if the bending moment, shear force or any other quantity uh, is required, uh, then uh, not necessarily that this particular uh, concept would work because uh, the for example, for bending moment, the participation of the higher mode uh, is very important uh, because uh, the higher the number of uh, mode, the more curvature we get into the mode shafts and since the curvature uh, influences the bending moment, therefore, uh, we should not miss out uh, higher modes. So, there are this general guideline is applicable for finding out a good displacement response. Now, let us uh, come to uh, another method called mode acceleration approach. The it was evolved because of uh, the fact that we wish to obtain a very good response of uh, any type that is whether bending moment, shear force or displacement with uh, less number of modes that is our intention. Uh, therefore, the classical mode summation approach that is the classical modal analysis technique is improvised to uh, obtain a method which is called a mode acceleration method or mode acceleration approach. It is found that this mode acceleration approach provides a good estimate of the response quantity with few number of modes. And the reason for this is shown over here. Uh, if we write down the equation of motion for the ith mode, uh, then uh, the equation would look like this, where lambda i is the mode participation factor in the ith mode, j i is the generalized displacement in the ith mode. This equation can be now rewritten in this form that is j i is equal to 1 by omega i square into minus lambda i x double dot g that is we divide uh, this by omega i square. Then this entire thing is taken on to this side, we, uh, therefore, it becomes negative and we have 1 by omega i square within bracket this entire quantity. Now, we can have now the summation that means, the j i, the summation of j i for all the modes over here, this summation now can be written like this. That is summation of this j i multiplied by phi i that gives the um, true response of the quantities uh, 
provided we take the contribution for all the modes. Now, here what we do is that we do not take the contribution from all modes, but we take contribution for say for the first m modes. So, this summation is done for m modes only. So, therefore, this summation is also made for m modes and this summation is also done for the m mode. Now, let us look at the equation a quasi static equation in which we write down k multiplied by x t that is we are performing a quasi static analysis that is equal to minus a my x double dot g that is the for a single point excitation system that is the force earthquake force that is uh, acting at every instant of term time t. So, for this basically if we solve this equation we will get a quasi static response of x t not the dynamic response. Now, this equation can be now converted into the a modal equation modal quasi static equation by multiplying pre multiplying uh, k by phi i t and con, uh, substituting for x t as phi into z phi i and z i that is the, the contribution coming from the first mode. Then on this side also we multiplied by phi i t and divide this by phi i t m phi i by this code that for the i th mode we find out the generalized mass and on the right hand side also we divide it by phi i t m phi i. Now, we know that from the modal equation uh, or the modal analysis that phi i t k phi is equal to k bar i this will be a single quantity and phi i t m phi i is the generalized mass at the i th mode and if we divide k by k bar i uh, by m bar i then we get the natural frequency square uh, uh, for that particular mode. So, uh, this entire quantity over here will turn out to be omega i square z i and uh, this quantity is uh, known as the mode participation factor for the i th mode and uh, this actually all of you know uh, from your dynamic analysis. So, we can uh, substitute uh, this uh, and uh, write minus lambda i into x double dot g. So, from this we can get the value of z i is equal to minus lambda i x double dot g divided by omega i square. So, this is the if I perform a quasi static analysis for this system then the uh, first mode shape will have a contribution to this quasi static response which can be described by this that is minus lambda i x double dot g omega i square. Now, if we look into this equation, so uh, this equation is nothing but a summation of this quantity that is the first generalized displacements contribution to the quasi static response in the i th mode and that is summed over for all the modes or m number of modes that is what I said before. Now, if we wish to get a correct value for this quasi static response then instead of summing it up for the m number of modes we should sum it up for all the modes. Now, if we sum it up for all the modes then the response that we get that will be equal to x t and this x t can be obtained from a quasi static analysis of the structure. So, what we uh, say is that uh, if we wish to find out the response of the system 
by adding up the contribution from different modes, then we can split this response into two parts. One is a quasi static part, which can be obtained by solving this quasi static equation, another is a dynamic part. Now, in this quasi static part, it is possible to consider the contribution of all the modes that is all n number of modes because if we instead of solving this if we solve this quasi static equation then we can straight away get the value of xt and this xt is the quasi static response of the system and one can replace this entire summation of course it should be multiplied by phi i also the mode shape coefficient so, we can replace this entire thing by the quasi static response. So, that is what is uh, shown over here and that is uh, the in the mode acceleration approach we write down the response uh, to be is equal to the phi i that is the mode shape coefficient in the ith mode lambda i x double dot g divided by omega i square. So, this uh, constitute the what is known as the uh, uh, contribution to the quasi static response and this is the uh, contribution uh, to the dynamic response. So, if I sum it up from 1 to m is equal to n that is all modes then it comes uh, uh, to be equal to r bar t that is the quasi static response of the system by solving the equation k x t is equal to minus m a i x double dot g. So, that can be easily obtained from a, a static analysis and then we consider the number of modes which are less than the total number of modes and we can choose maybe first 5 or 10 modes of a structure over here. Since in this uh, calculation we have considered one part of the response uh, in, in calculating one part of the response we have taken into consideration contribution of all modes. Uh, therefore, this uh, response is better than the usual mode analysis technique because in the usual mode analysis technique we uh, consider only the first few modes for obtaining the solution, but here we have uh, divided the response into two uh, components. In the first component we consider uh, the contribution from all the modes and that we are calling, calling as r bar t and then here we are considering only first few modes for obtaining this dynamic response. And in most of the cases we uh, see that this part this quasi static parts predominates the uh, response quantity of interest. So, therefore, we obtain the response uh, by uh, this mode acceleration technique and uh, uh, we can get a better result by uh, uh, considering only first few modes of the structure. So, the so solution is obtained like this first we find out the quasi static response of the system that is we solve the problem statically uh, for a load of minus this this will not be r this will be i we are because we are talking of a single point excitation system. So, minus a m i x double dot g and then find this quantity from the modal equation and uh, we, we can see that this quantity is nothing but uh, is equal to minus lambda i x double dot g divided by omega square minus j i and j i we have already obtained minus lambda i x double dot g omega i square that is already known to us. So, therefore, this quantity gives uh, this z double dot i plus twice zeta omega i z dot i uh, 
divided by omega i square this quantity is uh, automatically known. So, therefore, uh, this quantity that means the acceleration and the velocity that the generalized acceleration and generalized velocity need not be computed separately. We can get uh, the information uh, about these two summations divided by omega i square uh, by knowing j di only because uh, lambda i is known x double dot g unknown and therefore, you can see that by knowing only j, j di we can uh, obtain the summation of these two quantities. So, uh, that makes basically uh, the entire calculation shorter and simpler. Uh, here the main important thing is that we perform a quasi static analysis uh, along with the dynamic analysis. Now, let us uh, look at uh, the entire thing uh, uh, that we have uh, said before the, in finding out the displacements. In finding out the displacement responses, uh, what we do is that either we can use mode acceleration approach or the classical modal analysis. In classical modal analysis, uh, the number of modes that is to be considered uh, is obtained from the mass participation factor, but that guideline uh, is valid for uh, the displacement response. Uh, if one has to calculate the uh, internal forces or the bending moment shear force etcetera, then one has to take into consideration higher number of modes. Uh, if we use uh, the mode acceleration approach, then for any response quantity of interest, we can obtain a better estimate of the uh, response quantities uh, by using a less by using less number of modes. In that, we perform two analyses: one, a quasi-static analysis in which we consider the contribution from all modes and the other is a dynamic analysis in which we need not calculate jet, uh, the generalized acceleration and generalized velocities. By knowing the generalized displacement itself, uh, we can obtain uh, the uh, contribution that is coming from the dynamic analysis. And uh, that uh, contribution may be considered only for first few modes and we can sum them together. So, that uh, mode acceleration technique um, uh, is uh, found to provide a better results uh, for finding out any uh, kind of response be it the um, bending moment, shear force, drift or uh, whatever uh, be the response uh, quantity that you want. Now, let us uh, look into how we can find out uh, the bending moment and shear forces uh, in a particular structure because the uh, dynamic analysis that we have talked about so far provides us the displacement. And uh, uh, from that displacement, we have to finally calculate the, uh, the bending moment and shear force and each of the members that is uh, called the internal forces. Now, one can um, uh, obtain uh, these internal forces by uh, two approaches. First approach is that once we know the displacements uh, at every uh, degree of freedom of this structure uh, and uh, since we know the member properties or in other words the stiffness matrix for individual members, then from that one can obtain the bending moment and shear forces. Uh, so, let us look at that how do you do this. So, if we uh, consider a particular node over here and a node over here at these uh, two nodes the dynamic analysis provides us say this displacement and these displacements. So, because the dynamic uh, analysis uh, generally condensed out all the rotational degrees of freedom and the translational degrees of freedom are considered as a dynamic degrees of freedom. So, the response analysis 
uh, provides us x t that is the displacement. Now, for finding out the bending moment and shear force in this member, we uh, need also the rotations that is taking place uh, at the two nodes. And in order to obtain that, we use the condensation relationship uh, that we had um, uh, uh, obtained uh, uh, before for finding the condensed stiffness matrix corresponding to dynamic degrees of freedom. And uh, if you recall, uh, the rotational degree of freedom is written as minus k theta theta inverse into k theta delta into delta, where delta is the dynamic degrees of freedom or the translational degrees of freedom and theta uh, basically are the rotational degrees of freedom that we wish to condense out. So, we substitute in the, the other set of in the other set of equation this theta and by the substituting that we get a condensed stiffness matrix which corresponds to only uh, delta degrees of freedom and k theta theta is the partitioned uh, matrix uh, corresponding to theta degrees of freedom only and k theta delta is the coupling matrix between the uh, rotation and the displacement degrees of freedom. So, uh, uh, with the help of this equation, we can find out the value of theta at each node uh, because we know delta that has been obtained from the dynamic analysis. So, uh, we now know the rotations also at each degree of freedom. Once we know the rotation, then if I take any member, then at the two ends of the members, we have the displacements and rotations, but all of them are in the global coordinate. Now, from the global coordinate, we convert this to local coordinate system. Uh, for that, we use the transformation uh, matrix. Using the transformation matrix, one can obtain uh, these uh, displacements and rotations uh, in the local coordinates. And once we get these displacement and rotations in the local coordinate, which is called as delta vector, then the member and forces, internal forces can be written as k m into delta, where k m is the member stiffness matrix in the local coordinate and delta are the, the degrees of uh, or the displacements at the two ends of the member in the local coordinate. So, this is the first approach uh, by which one can obtain the internal forces uh, uh, in the structure after we have performed the dynamic analysis. The second approach uh, uh, is uh, that we use the mode shape coefficient for the response quantity of interest. Now, uh, what we mean by the mode shape uh, coefficient for a response quantity of interest would be uh, clear from this. Uh, the eigenvalue solution that we have performed uh, that provides us the mode shape coefficient for displacement. So, therefore, phi that we use in our modal analysis that phi correspond, correspond to the mode shape coefficient for displacement. Now, this uh, if we are wanting to find out the mode shape coefficient for bending moment or shear force or for any other response quantity of interest, then we uh, can obtain it in this particular fashion. If I take the ith mode, the ith mode can be uh, represented by this equation k into phi i is equal to m phi i omega i square that follows from the eigenvalue problem that is that we are solving. Here this particular equation can be written k x is equal to m omega square x. Now, for the ith mode, the x becomes phi i. So, for any mode, this is valid. So, now if you look into this equation, then this is simply a, a static uh, equation uh, in that uh, 
d k into phi i uh, that is the left hand side of the static equilibrium equation. And if I consider the entire thing as p i a load then this is the right hand side load. So, we have a, a static equation matrix equation which we can write as k phi is equal to uh, p i and p i is known because mode shape is known, mode shape or displacement is known, omega i is known and we multiply it by uh, a matrix. So, we get the value of p i. So, p i is known. Now, we can view the entire thing like this. In the first mode, uh, this equation uh, represents that as if the entire structure is subjected to a static load of p i and if I analyze it, then the displacements that we will get will be equal to phi i. Once we know the value of the displacements phi i, then from there one can find out the bending moment and shear force for any element and we will proceed uh, uh, as before that is first from the uh, displacements uh, we will obtain the rotations and once we know the rotations then one can get the values of bending moment and shear force uh, at the ends of any element or any member. Uh, so, therefore, uh, the these bending moment and shear force that I will get for a particular mode by solving this equation that is solving this static problem, uh, then that bending moment and shear force is called the mode shape coefficient for bending moment or shear force or any response quantity of interest. Uh, so, we can sum up like this that usual eigenvalue solution provides as a mode shape coefficient for displacement. If we wish to find out the mode shape coefficient for any other response quantity of interest, then we can solve a static problem in which we apply a static load in each mode equal to m into phi into omega i square as a static load and for that we find out the bending moment shear force on any response quantity of interest and that quantity will be called as the, the mode shape coefficient for that response quantity of interest. So, what we do is that uh, then we use uh, the usual mode summation technique x t is equal to phi i into z i i is equal to 1 to m whatever mode we wish to consider number of modes uh, we sum it over there that is the displacement. Similarly, if I want to find out bending moment at any particular section then we sum it up for all the modes this product that is phi bending moment i that is for the ith mode the bending moment that you have obtained that is the bending moment. Uh, uh, coefficient for that mode multiplied by z i. So, uh, one can obtain uh, the uh, bending moment shear force or any internal forces by this technique as well. It depends upon uh, the individual which uh, technique they prefer, but uh, in the beginning um, of the program if one can compute after finding out the mode shapes uh, for uh, the structure, if one can find out the mode shape coefficients also for different response quantities and store it, then this method turns out to be a better method for finding out the uh, different uh, quantities uh, of interest. Uh, next we uh, come to the uh, state space analysis. Uh, if we wish to obtain again uh, the modal analysis or use the modal analysis technique for the state space equation, uh, then uh, we um, follow in, a, in the same fashion that is we use uh, j t, we write down the displacement j t is equal to phi into q, uh, where phi is the mode shape matrix and q is the generalized displacement. Uh, 
and then substitute into the uh, state space equation and the state space equation is of the form of z dot is equal to a z plus f g we have seen before. Uh, so, in place of uh, z dot we write down phi into q dot uh, it comes from this equation and in place of z we substitute phi into q and then uh, we uh, uh, add on to it the f g that is the, uh, the load vector. Then this is uh, multiplied uh, pre multiplied by phi inverse on this side. So, on this side also we pre multiplied by phi inverse and this load vector also is multiplied by phi inverse. So, since phi inverse phi will provide us a uh, diagonal unit matrix and therefore, that diagonal unit matrix multiplied by q dot that becomes a diagonal matrix consisting of only q dot i and uh, phi inverse a phi again becomes decoupled because that is the property of the Eigen value. The Eigen values uh, that is the Eigen vectors rather, the, rather the, it is the property of the Eigen vectors and uh, the property of the Eigen vector is that it is orthogonal to the A matrix. So, therefore, this product that means this product of these three matrices again becomes a diagonal matrix and once it becomes a diagonal matrix then there uh, we get two n uncoupled equations uh, where n is the degree of freedom and each uh, equation is a first order differential equation and in this fun first order equ uh, differential equation lambda i that becomes the uh, what is known as the, the Eigen values of the matrix A. So, we can uh, write down such equations which will be 2 n in number. Next for solving this problem in time domain uh, each one of these uncoupled equation will require initial condition. So, this initial condition is obtained from that that is uh, q 0 if we wish to find out that means, this equation uh, is in terms of the generalized coordinate whereas, the z is the actual coordinate system or the structural coordinate system. So, uh, since we are solving the equation in the uh, modal coordinate system or the generalized coordinate system, then we have to provide the proper initial condition in terms of the generalized coordinate. So, that we obtain by uh, this uh, inverting that means, finding out q over here q is equal to phi inverse z. So, that is what we write uh, in this equation. So, q 0 is equal to phi inverse z 0 and from there we get the uh, initial condition that is to be used for solving each one of the modal equation in uh, the generalized coordinate. In fact, uh, the, in the same way uh, we should find out the uh, initial condition for all the modal equation that, it, that we have uh, that you have shown for the second order differential equation that uh, we solved before. So, both in the case of a state space analysis and the usual second order solution of the coupled second order differential equation, we need to find out the initial condition and uh, corresponding to the generalized coordinate. Uh, and in for actual coordinate, we know the initial conditions. So, the relationship that exists between the initial condition of uh, between the generalized coordinate and the actual coordinate system that uh, relationship is uh, shown over here. So, we, we require in that case the phi inverse. If we wish to solve the problem uh, that means, uh, 
in the frequency domain for the state space analysis, then we take up again this equation and treat it as a, um, a single degree uh, or, or, or a single state space equation and this single state space equation for that Hj omega is uh, written as i omega minus lambda i to the power in, uh, uh, inverse of it. So, uh, that also has been discussed before while solving uh, a state space equation for a single degree of freedom system. And uh, in the frequency domain as before we use the FFT algorithm that is um, uh, we first find out the frequency contents of the response uh, by multiplying H j omega with the frequency contents of the load, uh, generalized load uh, that is uh, uh, this is the generalized load phi inverse F g that will be generalized load that will be Fourier synthesized. After it is Fourier synthesized we multiply with H j omega and then we add on to that uh, the complex conjugate and the entire uh, numbers would be uh, uh, given as an uh, input to IFFT and the IFFT would provide us the responses uh, in, in time. So, uh, an example is solved uh, in which uh, uh, we had a uh, problem of this type uh, is simple frame and it is subjected to the same ground acceleration at the two supports and for that uh, this is the k matrix, this is the m matrix uh, and these are the four frequencies of the system and these are the four modes corresponding to the four frequencies and uh, we obtained a C matrix for that finding out alpha and beta from the first two frequencies and once we get uh, the C matrix then we can obtain the state space matrix A for the entire thing and go for a state space analysis. The uh, state uh, uh, space that is A uh, the eigen values of the A uh, that turns out to be a complex number and uh, these are the four eigen values of the problem and using these uh, four uh, what to call the eigen values we decoupled uh, the state space equation into a single degree of freedom state space equation. So, in this case we had uh, the since there are 4 degrees of freedom. So, we will have uh, 4 single degree of freedom state space equation and we can also solve this problem using mode, al uh, mode acceleration approach, uh, mode summation approach uh, in time domain as well as in frequency domain. So, the all the results are shown over here, the base shear uh, is the quantity of interest over here rather than the displacement. Therefore, uh, you can see that uh, here we are uh, uh, wanting to find out uh, the, uh, the response quantity as base shear. Therefore, uh, it is possible to solve the problem in two different ways. Either by you know, finding out the base shear directly from the displacements that we get at different stories and finding out uh, the forces at each story level and sum them together to find out the base shear or we can straight away find out the uh, mode shape coefficient for the base shear and in each mode and multiply it by z i and sum it over the number of modes that we consider. Since here we are considering only the, uh, it is only a problem of uh, the 4 degree of freedom. So, we have considered all the 4 degrees of freedom or, or all, all the 4 modes in finding out the responses. So, uh, this uh, result shows that by mode acceleration approach uh, 
the responses that you have obtained for the base shear. Uh, these uh, shows the same response uh, that is the base shear using the state space uh, analysis and both these uh, analysis are obtained. Uh, uh, this one we have uh, used the mode acceleration method that is uh, we have uh, used the solution in the uh, time domain. Here uh, we obtained by the state space analysis here we have used the frequency domain analysis that is we have Fourier transformed the load and uh, uh, use uh, uh, the response uh, or opt obtain the responses using uh, FFT. Now uh, at the end of this uh, chapter that is chapter uh, on the uh, response analysis for uh, a uh, specified uh, ground motion. Uh, the at the end of this chapter in the book, uh, I have outlined the compositional steps uh, uh, that are uh, required for developing a program in the MATLAB by using all the methods that we have discussed before. And the steps that are uh, given can be uh, what we call divided into three segments. The first segment uh, consists of computation of basic elements required for all types of analysis. For example, you have to obtain the overall stiffness matrix, then condensed stiffness matrix, then from the condensed stiffness matrix again the non-support degrees of freedom and support degrees of freedom matrices, uh, they are isolated, then coupling matrices are considered. So, all these uh, com and then uh, one can obtain uh, the quasi static analysis of the system for the ground motion, uh, the mode shapes frequencies and for each mode shape one can also find out the mode shapes for uh, the bending moment shear force etcetera. All these kinds of computations con consist uh, uh, are contained in the first part of the program and the results can be stored. In the second part of the program, the time domain analysis, uh, direct modal and mode acceleration approach and state space approach, all of uh, them are uh, outlined and uh, uh, one can obtain the solution of any problem or any structure in time domain. And uh, the third part or the last part is the frequency domain analysis covering again all the cases that you have considered in the time domain analysis that is the direct analysis, modal analysis, state analysis, so on.